good evening, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Wang Gongwu, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to National Library's prominent speaker series. Allow me to do a very brief introduction of our guest speaker for tonight. Besides holding key appointments such as Chairman of the East Asian Institute, Chairman of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, Chairman of the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies, and University Professor, National University of Singapore, our guest speaker was also conferred the International Academic Prize and Fukuoka Asian Cultural Prizes. He's written numerous publications in both English and Chinese, such as the Chinese Overseas from Earthbound China to the Quest for Autonomy in 2000, Don't Leave Home, Migration and the Chinese in 2001, and Diasporic Chinese Ventures, edited by Greg Benton and Yu Hong in 2004. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, may I present to you and welcome Professor Wang Gongwu. Good evening, thank you very much for inviting me, uh, Asher. When I was invited to give this lecture, I, I knew that the uh, National Library did not expect me to do justice to a topic that uh, would need volumes to cover. They want to draw attention to the subject and have someone open up a discussion on how the subject might be pre perceived today. Now, for decades, I have struggled off and on with aspects of Chinese identity for, in China as well as among the Chinese overseas. Um, in 1985, I went beyond the safety of history to explore some recent perspectives and actually hosted a conference at the ANU in, in Australia on the subject of changing identities of the Southeast Asian Chinese since World War II. Though well, that made me even more aware that this is a very difficult subject. It's difficult to pin down the concept of identity in a world that was changing so fast, especially during the 20th century. Tonight, I've come to share with you some of my ideas about identity uh, it is foolhardy of me to do this in front of an audience who knows Singapore well. And I'm conscious that I'm not telling you anything new about the city-state itself. I hope that you will find it interesting to hear about my, at least my efforts, to understand the subject. What is new for me is to try and connect identity with loyalty, as I've been asked to do. And I believe that, um, I believe that uh, identity precedes loyalty. It can, uh, it can clarify what one is to be loyal to when you know what your identity is. Uh, this is an issue that I have taken for granted before and not uh, carefully examined. So I found thinking about it a, <laughs> a very useful exercise for me too. It is well known that there have never been only one kind of Chinese identity. And this is particularly true uh, of those who left home to settle abroad, abroad and, and had to adapt to different circumstances and different social and political environments. Like migrants everywhere, Chinese have multiple idea, identities, some superficial and momentary, others very deep and permanent. At the personal level, Chinese can choose which identity to emphasize at any one time. They could come from a wide range, from surface identities linked with one's work, hobby, social circles, and so on, to some very deep and passionate identities which um, uh, expressed through commitments to family, to country, religious faith, even a political party or, or, and its ideology. 
Also, different adjectives might be used to characterize their identity. For example, arrogant, cunning, hardworking, backward, superstitious, China-centered. Now, with each of them, various cultural and political judgments were made. And for centuries, most Chinese were powerless to change such a labeling and were frustrated by the failure to prove them misleading or wrong. Obviously, self-identity as Chinese could be quite different from being identified by others as someone Chinese. Often, attributes are selectively used, such as a filial son, loyal brother, friend, or partner, to describe what was Chinese. This could be used to determine how Chinese someone was. Also, when we speak of different kinds of Chinese, we might expect them to have different identity mixes. For example, those found among Baba or Sinke, different. Traditionalists or radicals, again different. Chinese educated, English educated, and so on. We would expect these mixes to emphasize different identities to different peoples and at different times and places. Certainly, there are official and legal identities that cannot be freely challenged. For example, being registered as Chinese uh, at a point of entry to Singapore or in a court of law, or when receiving travel papers or permits to set up businesses, and so on. Now, most people thus have more than one identity and are unlikely to have a single, unchanging identity all their lives. How then does identity relate to loyalty? We can speak of degrees of loyalty as we can of layers of identity. For example, traditional Chinese place loyalty to family above all others. And that could translate to loyalty to the chief, to the prince, to the emperor, and all forms of authority. But they also recognize loyalty to friends and partners in any enterprise, and often used kinship terms to describe that. Today, Chinese, like many others, may expect loyalty to country to take precedence over the others, even to the extent of saying, my country, right or wrong. But others would claim that there are loyalties that rise above that. The strongest are values conscientiously expressed that are akin to absolutes in religious faith, followed by assertions of right and wrong. But also where there are clear injunctions to perform certain rites of certain rites and rituals at specific times. For example, practices in relation to births and deaths, to rites of passage, to marriage conditions, and so on. And these must be respected and may override all other loyalties. <clears throat> Unlike identity, conflicts of loyalty can be more unyielding. In the two centuries of Singapore's modern history, some kinds of loyalty have coexisted, like being a British subject and culturally Chinese. Others, like being loyal to a family, to a god, or a set of gods, to a secret society, or a banned political party. What prevailed was often determined by the exercise of force and law. Most of the time, however, the practices of a plural society allowed some give and take and some freedom to choose. And this is the background to the expressions of identity and loyalty during the three distinct periods of modern, Chinese, uh, modern Singapore history that I, I want to use. The first period I take to be the period from the early years to the 1870s when the port colony came to be seen as the center of a larger polity uh, 
under British administration and control, the British Empire in short. The second is when British Malaya emerged as a mixed form of a colonial state and rising Chinese collective interests sought to redefine their place in that British Malaya. And later these interests had, had led, to, led to some Chinese to prepare for new roles once they saw that the British would eventually depart. The third follows the changes during the past 50 years where the new regime, the independent Singapore, was challenged to convince a Chinese majority population that it was in their best interest to lead a plural society to become a new kind of some kind of nation state. And beyond that, they could also help to propel Singapore to an important place in the global economy. For a few decades at the, in the earliest history, Singapore was the newest port in the Malay world. The first Chinese who came from that world were largely Baba Chinese who had worked with Dutch and British merchants keenly interested in trading with China. They came largely from Malacca and the nearby islands and were familiar with the Malay elites as well as with Anglo-Dutch officials. The British found them invaluable to get the port off the ground, off to a good start, and most of them were descendants of Chinese men with local wives. They were a closely knit group, proud of their ancestral customs and practices, but did not identify with their homes in China. Others had also been trading and working in the neighborhood and came to Singapore and received help from Baba Chinese to work here. Theirs was a more xiangtu, a localized Chinese culture brought out of their homes in China. They knew their family and village origins and located them in entities like provinces like Fujian and Guangdong, but did not identify with the Qing Empire. If anything, they sympathized with those who hated the Manchus and wanted to restore Han Chinese rule. After the British took Hong Kong and opened up treaty ports in China, many more Chinese spread out in every direction, in fact, to different continents, including thousands who came to Singapore on the way to other islands and also to the Malay states. Many of them stayed on in Singapore, and they soon outnumbered the earlier Baba Chinese. The British had to learn to differentiate between the varieties of peoples who who stressed their different origins and were organized accordingly. The Babas were counted on to be relatively loyal to colonial rule, while these Sinke, these newcomers, were only loyal to their own kinsmen. Some were active in secret brotherhoods that defended them and they fought for them. It was also a time when the imperial order in China faced numerous rebellions. The most serious of these, very well-known one, the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom, was exceptionally brutal, not only against Manchu rule, but also against the literati classes, the ruling elites, or even those of Han, Han, origin, Han Chinese origin. Now, these rebels generally wanted to up, uh, up, in fact, upended the traditional norms. And when they finally failed in China, many survivors escaped to the Malay world, including to Singapore. And they identified with the secret societies and were usually alienated from any established authority. Although they were small in number, they were activists and they tended to identify with clandestine organizations. The Chinese quickly became the majority population in Singapore. We know that it was surprisingly fast. And the British took special measures to ensure that their rival organizations avoided open conflict and respected British laws. A new kind of identity was introduced to the Singapore born. When any of these traded in China's treaty ports, British consular services protected them as British subjects. Qing officials 
those in Fujian and Guangdong, for example, even in Shanghai, resented this. And some began to rethink their policy towards the Chinese overseas. However, it was not until the 1870s that policies were changed and the first consuls were appointed to Singapore. The officials then discovered that the well-established Chinese actually welcome their offers of protection as subjects of the Qing Empire. Thus, some could now, some Chinese could now become two kinds of imperial subjects, British and Chinese. Most Chinese were proud to be Chinese, whatever that meant to the British and Dutch and various Malay and Thai rulers. But the idea of being Chinese nationals did not yet arise. Other loyalties still prevailed, from filial piety to parents, and loyalty to immediate family, to inherited religious practices and other cultural artifacts, collectively to their district or dialect uh, communities. They had no expectations from Qing China. Instead, where the British provided effective govern government governance, some Chinese enjoyed special relations with the colonial authority. Thus, the Chinese lived with multiple identities quite comfortably and chose which ones to stress when called on. At the same time, there was a hierarchy of loyalties where family would come first, but allegiances to whatever could help their livelihood were also allowed. The second period, the, starting from the 1870s, uh, marked the 1870s marked a turning point. For the British, intervention in the Malay states following the Treaty of Pankow created new regimes of control. For the Chinese, the new consulate general in Singapore, established at about the same time, was the first step in giving them an officially recognized identity. More Chinese were now drawn to British Malaya and many of them used Singapore as their base. The establishment of a consulate was a reminder that this was a time when the idea that everyone should belong to some nation or another, that idea was spreading around the world. Thus, the Chinese overseas, whether China-born or British subjects, were seen as citizens or nationals for the first time but temporarily living abroad, hence the idea of being Hua Chiao, resident temporarily abroad. In that capacity, these Chinese found it increasingly painful to see Qing China continue to weaken and its efforts to modernize and reform being aborted. Some Chinese then openly supported the drive to reject the Manchu and call them foreign rulers. And that gave them a baseline for the growing national awareness. Being Chinese was being redefined by using terms that, now, that were now hardly distinguishable from those that Japan had adopted from the European nation states in order to unite the Japanese people. Similar terms were adopted by the Chinese the revolutionaries who fought against the Manchus. The pre-national Malay world around Singapore was similarly aroused with this sense of nationality that was spreading everywhere. And not least by those who, were, who noticed the large numbers of Chinese amongst them. And what being Chinese meant was now questioned at all levels of society, by all sections, sectors, of the populations, not least by those who saw them purely as foreign immigrants. At one end, everyone who originated from China was grouped together as Chinese. And this implied a single collective of people. Sun Yat-sen, who lived here for a while, also in Penang, and got to know quite a lot of the people here, and wanted unity among the Chinese he met 
was very unimpressed with this idea that the Chinese were a collective. On the contrary, he compared the Chinese to a large plate of loose sand, unable to cooperate and very difficult to unite. At the other end, straight Chinese who claimed to be loyal to the British Empire contributed money and effort to support empire war efforts, ranging from the Boer War to both the First and the Second World War. In between were men with Baba backgrounds, like um, Gu Hongming, who's very famous, who discarded what he was taught about modern Western civilization, discarded them altogether, and passionately supported the total retention of Confucian traditional values. Others, like Lim Boon Keng, moved only halfway. He wanted both Chinese to be both modern and Confucian at the same time. Yet others were more decisive. A very obvious person to mention is someone like Tan Kah Kee, who aligned his Hokkien culture with national aspirations and had seemed to have no, no difficulty of doing that. And he exhorted his compatriots to identify fully with the new China. He was clear what being Chinese meant and was steadfast in acting as a patriot. But uncertainty still remained about what defined the Chinese. After the fall of the Manchu Qing Empire, a new formula was devised to include everyone within the borders of the former Qing Empire. The Five Nation Republic was the term that was used, the Wu Zhu Gong He, uh, identified the Han, the Manchu, Mongol, uh, the Muslim, Hui, and Tibetans as Chinese, as Zhonghua Minzu. This is a new term, totally new, devised at the turn of the century. Uh, this new inclusive definition meant that China was nation building on a different platform altogether, on a very large scale. For those in Singapore who came from southern China, this new construct was rather abstract and remote. So the Chinese Republic launched a massive campaign to re-educate everyone to understand this new formula. The central theme was that the sacred land of China was being cut up and the country dismembered. Including everybody within the borders was the only way to defend the heritage. Being Chinese was thus raised to a much higher level. Colonial policy encouraged Chinese to bring their families and to settle here, but essentially left them to educate their children. Modern schools sprouted quickly and adopted the Chinese national curriculum. New generations of teachers inspired by the May 4th movement one of the most radical of the young people in China at the time, and brought their belief that Western scientific and democratic values could be used to unite China and recover its ancient glory. Newspapers educated the, the adult population to the power struggles that were occurring all over China by bringing that politics to, into Singapore. Chinese of all classes began to shape their identities and loyalties in response to this massive education campaign. The British were alarmed and tried to curb what they considered to be excessive national display, nationalist displays. But the alternative that they offered of becoming straight Chinese British subjects promised too little for most Chinese, especially for those who had been, who were now politically aroused by what was happening in China. The Baba also were divided. Some began to learn the national language and studied things Chinese in, to affirm their Chinese origins. National identity was widely asserted when the nationalists came to power, the nationalist government in China came to power in 1928. And when Japanese imperialists created the puppet state of Manchukuo and pushed further inland into northern China, the rising tide of nationalism became 
overwhelming. Japanese victories in Southeast Asia followed, and the British surrender of Singapore hit the Chinese the hardest. Three years of Japanese occupation forced them to rethink, all the Chinese to rethink who they were. They've reflected on their future beyond the British Empire. It was but a short step from anti-Japanese imperialism to anti-imperialism in general. Most people could now see a post-imperial world of independent states. This placed national identity above all others. The former colonies were ready to start afresh without Europeans in charge. Among Chinese, the numbers of local born had caught up with those born in China, and they looked for new identities and asked what they should now be loyal to. For the economy, the post-war economy to recover after the war, law and order was necessary. For the poorer working classes, Many were convinced that the time for exploitation was over. The fight for social, social justice was greatly appealing to most of them. For the young, many more schools were built to prepare them to live as post-colonial nationals. And they began to understand that the polity that replaced British rule would consist of a mix of peoples that looked to different national identities elsewhere, to China, to India, to Indonesia, Malayu Raya, and so on. Now, after the war ended, people in Singapore asked what they could now be. Never, below, never before was it so urgent to find an answer. Never before had political identity been defined in narrow national terms. They also had to confront the faded vision of the Malayan Union that the British experimented with. If Singapore were to be included in a communal dominated federation of Malaya, that would be, there would be further uncertainties. And on top of all the layers of ethnic, social, and cultural loyalties that everybody faced, the political identity of this Malaya was a central question. Should that state be in the hands of feudal bureaucrats and business classes carrying on the colonial heritage? Should it be a welfare state as many progressive states, especially in the developed Western world, had become? Or one that chose the revolutionary path as in China, in Vietnam, and even in Indonesia? Or should it be a state where ethnic majority dominance determine all issues of identity and loyalty? These are some of the questions that came up in more and more debates among all the people everywhere in both Malaya and Singapore. Now, these processes and alternative, or these questions, could not be separated from the larger struggle for global dominance between the United States and the Soviet Union, who had then brought their Cold War and reached and had this Cold War reach out to China and Southeast Asia. Once the Chinese Communist Party won power on the mainland, no Chinese anywhere was immune to the pressure to identify with one side or the other. Political identity, whether based on ideology or ethnicity, began to overwhelm all others. This takes me to the third period. The decades of uncertainty in um, China and British Malaya from the late 19th century to the 1960s saw the challenge of many identities for the Chinese. Singapore was the center for trade, news, and education, and became a node for change among the Chinese, the Chinese in the whole region. Numerous Teachers and journalists kept its Chinese population close to the developments in China. Many official delegations visited Singapore regularly, as well as hundreds of political exiles from the Kuomintang Chinese Communist Party 
CCP civil war from 1928 onwards down to the war. Furthermore, major efforts to raise funds to support the defense of China against the Japanese were inspired by community leaders like Tan Kah Kee, as I mentioned earlier. It is now hard to imagine, it is now hard to imagine how powerful the pull of China was for most Chinese in Singapore. Even before the Japanese occupation, patriotism had become mainstream and it challenged any residual loyalty to the British and their idea of a pluralist port city. Every Chinese could see that nationalism had become the most visible and potent political creed. Although many remained firm in their primary concern for family and clan and district associations, the pressure to give priority to national and ideological loyalties continued to grow. And this was particularly true for the graduates of Chinese high schools. In comparison, many at the English schools tended to identify with modern civic values, basically learned from Britain, or specific Christian values, if they believed in that. And only few admired the national and revolutionary movements in China. It was clear that the products of the two education systems in Singapore were growing apart. The war with Japan narrowed that gap for a while when Chinese and British interests coincided in their hatred of Japanese militarism. But when the war ended, this was set aside. When most of the Chinese educated sympathized with the anti-colonial forces and wanted to see the British leave as soon as possible. The Chinese remained divided into the 1950s. A small number, to, a small number continued to identify with the politics of China. A larger number engaged in the battle to determine their future in Singapore. But an even larger proportion of them longed for the return of normalcy so that they could protect their businesses and their livelihood and their families. And for this last group, the old formula of loyalty to family, to local cultures, remained paramount. They understood that Singapore was not China and could never, never ever, and could not ever claim to be part of China. They were content to live and work in a plural society and were ready to go on doing so. In that way, their cultural identity could be preserved and their children could share their loyalty to what they valued as intrinsically Chinese. As they saw it, what was central was continued access to the Chinese language. This is not only for practical reasons, but also because it gave meaning to their moral and social life. It was in this context that the campaign for Nanyang University was launched. Once it was clear that high school graduates could no longer pursue their tertiary education in China, the answer was obvious. Singapore should lead the way to build a Chinese language university. The response, not only in Malaya, but also elsewhere in the region, was overwhelming. In Singapore, Chinese once again felt they had a central role in the Nanyang, and a new kind of transnational Chinese could see Singapore as their base. The British were not prepared to support this in their, in their colony, and non-Chinese political leaders in Singapore shared those concerns. Some feared the Taiwan leaders would use it to nurture and recruit future anti-communist nationalists. Others saw it as a potential seedbed to further radicalize high school graduates who already lean or to already lent towards the new China. But the desire to raise the language and cultural levels higher was truly deep and genuine. The new university was a beacon of light that could serve the Nanyang Chinese, a valuable asset to Singapore and ultimately to the Malaya it would one day 
be part of. And this is how the Chinese would see that. Indeed, the founders had that cultural goal very much in mind. But the anti-communist war in China, with its anti-Chinese core, essentially, the Ganyang Malaysia campaign in Sukarno's Indonesia, and also the bitter battles that led to separation and independence for Singapore, all of these conspired to focus attention on the university's problems and not on its promise. Its political roles were consequently raised above its educational ideals. Thus, instead of becoming an institution that the Chinese educated could be loyal to, it stumbled along until forced to merge with the University of Singapore. And that left a cultural vacuum that has only been partially mended. In short, mainstream Chinese identity in Singapore was based on a language identity and loyalty, not on patriotism or chauvinism or the wish to import communism. Nor did it depend on any desire to restore traditional cultures. By the 1960s, after years of adapting to changing realities, that identity was committed to progress, to science, to freedom and democracy, to respect of the law, to whatever would enhance the lives of their families in the future of Singapore. However, it failed to convince those who believed that Singapore's future had to be built on its plural society. Those who from the start were afraid that this Chinese project would weaken, if not undermine, the multicultural foundations of the country. After Singapore's independence, the goal of achieving a national identity was clear. Its people would focus on the nation as the object of prime loyalty. What distinguished the state was its small size with almost no natural resources and its large population, the majority population. The long and contested decolonization process after 1945 revealed how much existing national and ethnic identities could threaten the underlying pluralist ideal. The different loyalties represented in here were all strong and could not be ignored. Fortunately, most of the younger generation of Chinese educated after the war had decided that Singapore was their home. Their Chinese identity was not tied to either the mainland People's Republic of China or the Republic of China in Taiwan, but was increasingly focused on their cultural heritage. The tumultuous events in China under Mao Zedong merely deepened the distance they now felt, and except among a few, being Chinese had nothing to do with communist ideology. Other uncertainties remained, not least those brought by unfriendly elements among Singapore's neighbors. In that context, the failed September 30th coup, the Gestapo in Indonesia, only weeks after Singapore's independence, was a stroke of good fortune. When the backlash against the coup destroyed the PKI, the Communist Party of Indonesia, that was a great relief for the new state. Furthermore, the Cultural Revolution in China followed after that, and the horrendous damage it did for Chinese culture and values removed any remaining inclination to admire that China. Singapore Chinese could once, could now think afresh about the makeup of their country and reflect on the kind of identity and loyalty that could come out of a commitment to what was meant to be a pluralist state. Everyone knew that this goal would not be easy to achieve. To define such a national identity that is not found anywhere else in Asia required very careful and sensitive education for all concerned. The fact that power was in the hands of the Chinese majority in Singapore made it incumbent upon its leadership 
to ensure that that power was not used to undermine that pluralist ideal. It could not depend on force alone. In the long run, it hinged on building a deep understanding of the equal rights of all Singapore citizens and the guarantee of security among its minorities. And such a commitment demanded, demanded open minds, a willingness to compromise, as well as great persuasive skill. Political parties are naturally tempted to woo, to woo voters by appealing to identity politics. It is therefore remarkable how that temptation has been curbed during the past 50 years. Nevertheless, defining an identity acceptable to the majority Chinese population was not enough. The new republic needed to build a viable economy in which Chinese entrepreneurs would become major stakeholders who are able to create new jobs for their people. Its history pointed to the port cities extended networks that served the region and beyond for at least 100 years. Chinese businesses were in the best position to help the country become indispensable for transnational companies to, who wanted, that wanted a hub in Southeast Asia. That also required peace in the workforce. The governing party knew that getting employers and employees to cooperate and share a common goal would dampen the appeal of identity politics among the working classes. It was significant how readily Chinese labor leaders responded to that development. The idea of becoming a global city was far seen, but the new state had to act cautiously at this early stage of its own nationhood. Depending on multinational corporations, could inhibit the growth of a strong national identity. It could also affect the language-based identity most Chinese valued. Fortunately, the rapid rise of China, quite unexpected, enabled Singapore to use that identity to its advantage. Second language learning was strongly supported by at the, at, at the institutions of higher learning by technological and financial skills. And so very quickly, most parents saw the benefits of that China, collect, China connection and readily responded to the opportunities provided. The result was a very strong drive to excel at all levels. It shows how this policy has done more for Chinese, Singapore Chinese, a Singaporean Chinese identity than all the political rhetoric in the past. The majority community can now see that its fear of cultural loss is greatly reduced. I have not been asked to go beyond the 20th century, so I shall not go further. <laughs> but conditions are changing as the world adjusts to, uh, to Chinese economic power. It is timely to ask how Chinese cultural identity will change, that is, cultural identity in China itself will change, and how that will align with Singapore's Chinese or national identity. How will the younger generation of Chinese here respond to the new identities in China itself? If their identity, the Chinese identity in Singapore, were culturally secure, I would expect primary loyalty to Singapore not to, be not to be affected. We have seen what the Chinese overseas in Singapore and elsewhere have been through since the 19th century. They've had to change parts of their identities several times and have learned to manage the changes quite successfully. From the extreme demands of Chinese nationalism to accusations of being the fifth column of the communist world, from being called Hanjian traitors by other Chinese to being labeled as alien pandatam by local Bumiputra. They have been through it all. A deep-rooted pragmatism prevailed as they firmly confronted each kind of 
crisis and found themselves wiser and enriched by their experiences. I began this evening by saying that there has never been any one Chinese identity, that everyone has multiple identities. And Chinese in Singapore, obviously, were no exceptions. Over time, they learned that Chinese were always diverse, and it was in their own interest to acknowledge that diversity. That made most of them accept the norms of plural societies as something that they could live with and benefit from. I also suggested that each identity might call for a different level of loyalty. Some are immediate and conditional, while others are deep and unshakable. And there could be a hierarchy of loyalties, whereby some would always override others. For example, when loyalty to family, country, and culture are prior prioritized above all else. Having outlined these developments, I'm particularly impressed in the end by the way Singapore Chinese responded to an exceptional situation. I refer to the years after 1965 when they found themselves as the majority population in their own state with their leaders democratically elected to take power. This was unknown for any Chinese community outside China. And there were no roadmaps to tell them what they should do. Their leaders fell back on what distinguished this port city of Singapore, the condition that made them appreciate their lives in a plural society. They had lived with that long enough to understand what that meant and therefore focused on what needed to be done to sustain it. And Chinese leaders were wise enough not to abuse that majority position. Instead, they worked to find ways to create a new composite Singapore identity that would serve the country's long-term interests. This is, of course, still work in progress. There will be further challenges to test what, that has been, what has been established so far. Future generations will always have to manage this enterprise with sensitivity and care. My tentative conclusion is that given how the various Chinese in Singapore have been rational in dealing with multiple identities, they know how to distinguish the degree of loyalty that these identities would require. The second half of the 20th century saw the emergence of new norms for national identity. These expect the people of Singapore, not least the majority Chinese, to construct something beyond having multiple identities and exercising a hierarchy of loyalties. The ingredients for producing a composite identity seem to me now present, they're now present, although it is yet to have an agreed name. And such a construct would be contrary to ethnic-based national norms. It would always need to be defended when challenged. But given the possibility of building a pluralist nation that can also serve as a global city, I can imagine the Chinese communities, together with the others, contributing their share to that composite identity. What parts of the many identities in Singapore would that contain, I do not know. What layers of loyalty that might evoke, I also cannot foresee. However, I expect it to be an identity that is in integrative and distinctively multidimensional. And Chinese experiences in Singapore will have a unique place in that condition, in shaping that condition, a condition that will allow Singaporeans to say that they are also Chinese. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. Okay, so um, thanks again, Prof. Uh, 
Now we open the floor for commentaries or questions. If you have any question, please raise your hand, use the microphone so everyone can hear and understand your questions. All right, any questions on the floor? Okay. And introduce yourself, ma'am. Thank you very much, Professor, for that very erudite and fascinating um, insight. Uh, my name is Alex McKenzie. I'm from the British High Commission. Um, a lot of your talk was very much focused on the experience uh, and the perspective of ethnic Chinese in Singapore. Uh, and I wonder if you could also say a bit about the expectations and perspective about overseas Chinese loyalty and identity from the perspective of mainland China. Thank you. There are conditions where the Chinese in Singapore can determine their own definition of what is Chinese, what kind of Chinese they want to be. How China defends, uh, how China defines Chineseness or Chinese identities, and there are 1.3 billion of them, be very diverse and very different as I see it. Whether some of it might converge in the long run, I cannot tell at this stage. China is modernizing and changing very rapidly, responding to the demands of a, a very de complex world, highly international, highly cosmopolitan. And many of the well-educated Chinese today are, are, can, can make their homes almost anywhere in the world and be comfortable. So a lot is ch happening in China. The diversities within China are so complex, and I have many colleagues who have been studying this for a long while, and it is hard to know precisely how China itself is going to develop their future identity. And it won't be one single identity. I, I'm pretty convinced that it will end up also having multiple identities within the so-called Chinese nation, the very complex one that they now have, the Zhonghua Minzu kind of tradition, which includes everybody within the borders of China. That itself presumes immense diversity. So what is Chinese in China itself is a question mark. And it seems to me not likely that the Chinese in Singapore, the future gen younger generations of Chinese in Singapore, would want to seek that out to be a measure of how Chinese they should be. I think they themselves now, once, and this is the crucial if, that they feel culturally secure in Singapore, then they would develop their own lives in their own ways in, in sympathy with, in, in, in together with, the way Singapore itself would involve, evolve the, with that kind of composite identity that I believe Singapore will produce eventually. And I think the Chinese, those of Chinese origin in Singapore, will respond accordingly. They will be, contribu be contributing to that identity anyway. They can identify with parts of it already, but they will be making a major contribution to it, which they will feel some ownership for. And that, I think, again, would consolidate their sense of a different kind of Chineseness, but native and rooted to Singapore. I mean, I, I can't see exactly what it's going to be like, because then I'm too old now. I can't, I'm too much rooted in my own past to see that. But I can imagine it as I try to imagine what could happen in China. I mean, each trip I make to China, I meet different kinds of Chinese. Among the old, the young, the middle-aged, they are already so different. And I expect them to be even more different in their own way. Nothing to do with the rest of the Chinese overseas. They will find their own kind of Chinese identity to suit the way that very multiple, very multiple, pluralist, very multinational uh, uh, composition of people that they have within the enormously wide range of territory that the Chinese, the China now consists of. So how to put them side by side and say that they could uh, influence one another, I, I just don't see that as being a major problem. I think Singapore will have its go its own way it would be, and still be Chinese, but as defined by themselves, taking into account what ha is happening elsewhere, 
but not specifically one single Chinese identity, because there, it seems to me, never will be one. Thank you. Any more questions? OK, right here. Professor, good evening. I'm uh, Tan Kun Siang here. Um, okay, can I refer you to a perspective from the Babas? Uh, I'm from a Baba family and uh, seventh generation. So uh, we see ourselves as a, sort of a lost culture. We've uh, not been able to find our ground and our identity uh, ever since we've, been, we've sort of been deserted by the British. When uh, at one time, uh, my ancestors used to call themselves King's Chinese and Queen's Chinese, depending who was on the throne. Mm. So the thing is, uh, would you uh, consider that uh, the Babas were an accident of history? Or would there be in future uh, similar um, cycles of uh, immigration where if such a situation would happen again, uh, you would have another, uh, I would say, another community of Babas elsewhere in the world which uh, it would happen in the same situation? Thank you. I must confess that I have always been very impressed by the way the Baba over centuries remain Chinese in their own way. I remember also the days when nationalistic Chinese, those who were responding to China, thought the Baba were not Chinese enough. But that's a question of perspective and degree. I was always struck by the way the Baba were true and loyal to their traditional values in a way much more than the Chinese in China. Quite extraordinary. And the way they went out of their way to try and remain Chinese under any circumstances. I mean, I can go into this in some detail, but this is really quite striking that they insisted on being Chinese, tried everything they could to remain Chinese, to be seen as Chinese and acknowledged as Chinese for two or three hundred years at least. And in the meantime, changing. They were not stable. It was not just one identity. They were themselves all the time evolving and adapting to new circumstances and receiving new ideas and at the same time absorbing what they can of what they understood being Chinese meant. Not a, not a stationary or simple one idea. The only thing they didn't have, and this was what was um, pointed out by those Chinese from China, was they didn't keep the Chinese language. Now, this is why I mentioned this point about the language being one of the key features of the Chinese identity and their cultural sense of cultural belonging has been so strong. And that, is why, that was what divided the Baba from the Sinkes <coughs> more than anything else. Because on almost every other level, they, they could operate together, do all sorts of things together. And the only thing that kept them somewhat apart, uh, even at the time when they cooperated in so many things, was the fact that they did not speak Chinese, any form of Chinese. Now, what has happened in the last 50 years is that they are learning Chinese, at least those who have remained. I know there are some Baba families have decided to leave Singapore because learning Chinese was too hard for them or the, for their children, and that's a pity. But for most, this is no longer an issue. It's now one single policy for all people who have Chinese descent, who are of Chinese descent. The policy is that they all learn Chinese. So that policy has worked. I mean, it hasn't been perfect, and people complain that the Chinese are not good enough, or people don't use it more, more often or write it more better, or all kinds of complaints. But the fact is that those of Chinese descent in Singapore today have overcome this particular barrier that separated the straight Chinese, as you call them, from the new Chinese Sinkes who came, the language issue. That has been set aside. How that will improve or change its quality and so on, I, uh, 
I do not know for sure. But at least that has been overcome. So the question is, the experiences of the Baba of the 200, 200 or 300 years from Malacca and so on has also been very interesting because in a way, it is the experience of being local born and making Singapore home. Once all Chinese say Singapore is their home, I mean, those in Singapore say this is their home, then it probably doesn't matter whether you are of Baba or Sinke origins. You now are all local born. You share more and more, linguistically, culturally, politically, educationally, professionally, in almost every respect, the more convergence of all the people, that convergence is occurring and is deepening, it seems to me. Uh, it would seem to me then that experience of how to be Chinese as Baba may have lessons for all those later born in Singapore, local born, who also face the problem of what a local born Chinese should do to retain their sense of Chineseness and their pride in being Chinese. Now, they may not be the same because times have changed, the world has changed, but the fact that it can be done, that the Chinese were able, the Paranakan were able to do that for centuries, must give a lot of hope that the future will, can also be like that, that all those of Chinese descent would continue to be Chinese and will try very hard to be Chinese in all sorts of ways and will evolve their own sense of Chineseness distinct to themselves that they could be proud of. And this, all this could happen. And the experience of the Baba of the 300 years before and those of the Sinkes the last century well, it seems to me all will flow in the same direction uh, from now onwards. Thank you. Anyone? All right. Uh, I'm Jenny Chan from Civil Service College. I'd like to go back to the very first question about uh, the diverse Chinese identities in mainland China. Do you see the rising Chinese nationalism and this sense of victimhood uh, that's coming out from China. Now, would that be a unifying force for all the Chinese in, uh, in mainland China? And would that kind of form a common link between the Chinese from mainland China and also for the overseas Chinese in other countries? Thank you. That's a very good question and um, a tricky one because nationalism is a very modern phenomenon. And it, uh, to my mind, it doesn't come naturally. It, there's usually a reason for nationalism. And usually, it's because it is in the interest of those uh, who are responsible for governments or responsible for countries to be who believe that nationalism is necessary for them to consolidate their rule or to strengthen the country and make the country more better, easier to defend against their enemies and so on. So there are certain conditions that produce modern nationalism. One of them, of course, is that of a nation state. And this is where the complication becomes harder to, to fathom. The, the nationalism of a nation state was based on the fact that people thought they were one nation to begin with. And that one nation was threatened in some way or the other, and the emotions needed to be aroused to defend that nation. And the nation states in Europe, of course, had a very checkered history, long history, and I won't want to go into that. And none of that actually is directly comparable to what is happening in Asia. But all over Asia, we've learned that this is one good way to unite people against enemies. And governments have never hesitated to use that when necessary. So when governments find it need necessary to use nationalism, they almost invariably do. And uh, this is something that I hate to say is unlikely to change. Now that we've discovered this thing called nationalism and how useful it can be for those who want to stay in power. And China is no exception. Their ruling elites at, every, at any time have enormous problems within their own country. 
the need to keep the Chinese people united behind one particular regime or one particular party will always be there. And to try and keep 1.3 billion people united is a task I, I just find unimaginable. I mean, it's hard enough with 5 million. <laughs> so I don't know what it's like with 1.3 billion. So I don't know how the Chinese rulers can handle that. And the fact that there's nationalism is partly because the governing people in China find it useful to have a bit of nationalism around to help keep the country together. But at the same time, it is also a reflection of the nature of politics in China, that the people have tremendous restrictions about what they can or cannot say. Now, I'm very conscious of the fact that uh, we're always pointing out to the fact that there's no freedom of speech, no freedom of thinking, and so And this is not only true of China, but many, many countries are accused of that, and that is certainly true. But when you have limits on what you can say about your own government, but there are no limits as to what you can say about other people's governments, <laughs> that encourages a kind of nationalism, because you find that you have freedom of speech if you are critical of somebody else's government. <laughs> Since your own government doesn't like you to talk about itself, uh, that's a good sort of, uh, and, and the government probably finds it useful to let them have, let off steam, as it were, against somebody else. So I, I, I'm, not, I'm not being cynical. I'm just saying this is quite a natural development out of governments who are themselves facing enormous problems which can't be easily solved. And I am far from critical of the leaders of China. I find that they have an unenviable task. I wish them luck, but it's a horrible job to run that country. And in the, in the course of it, whether they want to restrict this or restrict that, tighten this up, you know, prevent criticism of one kind or the other, but then there always has to be some, some uh, room for to let the steam off, as it were, or the whole thing will blow. And that, I think, is what is behind some of the nationalism in China. Nationalism can come out of all sorts of things. As I said, political uh, goals are one, but also ignorance, just emotional frustrations of one kind or the other. It can come out in that form. So I don't want to generalize about nationalism. One has to look into the causes of some nationalisms are very different from others. On the surface, they may look alike, essentially anti somebody else, anti some other nation, but behind it all may be something far more complex and far more um, sensitive to local conditions of which we may not fully understand. So those problems are so alien to those of the people of Singapore. I can't imagine that the younger Chinese of Singapore, for example, would, would share that, any of that nationalism. It would be totally different. It comes from a, a different soil, so to speak, and it's growing in different ways, which are totally different from what is necessary in Singapore. Now, Singapore may need its own nationalism one day. If we have lots of enemies around, you may need to do that. But it has to be very carefully calibrated because there are many potential nationalisms in Singapore. That is, we've experienced that in the last uh, century. We know that it's there, but we're trying to replace that with this kind of pluralist, plural society ideal in the hope that that would produce a new kind of composite kind of sense of nation, which need not be nationalist in the same way, but nationalist in a completely different way. A nationalism that actually protects pluralism, for example, is a very different kind of nationalism. I mean, I can't quite imagine it. I don't myself understand it. But I believe that is something that we can possibly expect, because that is the way a plural society would grow if it, if it produces, in the end, a kind of composite identity how that composite identity responds to challenges and responds to threats to its survival is, at least at this point, 
hard for me to describe. Will you call it nationalism? I don't know. But does it need to have that kind of a name? That it doesn't need that label. It, it, it again raises these questions of degrees and hierarchies of loyalty. Um, if you if you sense that the loyalty is not to your ethnic identity or your even your cultural identity, but your primary loyalty for that moment is to save your country from destruction. You call it what you like. It may, be, it may not be nationalism. It is just a sense of a loyalty to an idea, an ideal, like a plural society ideal. If you believed in that and you thought that was threatened and were prepared to be actively supporting that ideal, would you call it nationalism? I don't know. But nevertheless, it could be just as passionate, just as strong, and could just as effective when necessary, when called on. Thank you. We have a gentleman here. Yeah. Uh, Professor Wang, uh, my name is Ma Wei Pin. Uh, my question is related to the first question that was asked, uh, and which is, uh, does the uh, Chinese government in Beijing regard all overseas Chinese as their subject still, and therefore subject to uh, their law and uh, owes them loyalty. Thank you. It's, it's always good to remind ourselves that the Chinese governments for centuries never cared about the Chinese overseas. <laughs> um, if you look at the whole of the Ming Qing, just take more recent history, the Ming Qing dynasty right down to the, towards the end of the 19th century, none of the governments or officials even thought about the Chinese overseas. As far as they were concerned, these are misguided people who left the country. <laughs> uh, bad luck to them, and good luck if they survive. But this is not the responsibility of the Chinese government. And you can see that through the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. All kinds of things are happening in the region and in China itself. Uh, there was virtually no attention, and you can look up the historical records, virtually no attention to the Chinese overseas. How did they discover the overseas Chinese? And we do know that. It, it was a specific time. I mentioned that when I say 1870s, when they built the first consulate here. It was a response to what the West was doing. When um, Chinese labor was recruited to serve all over the place, Southeast Asia was only one of them. So they served in, in uh, North America, Australasia, Central, Amer Central America, Latin America, contract labor was sent all over the place. They were totally unprotected. Nobody cared for them. Certainly no government in China knew much about it. But then it was pointed out, as all these Chinese got into trouble, and governments they, over there raised questions about what to do with these Chinese when they're in trouble, if the Chinese government, at that time the Qing government, didn't do anything about them. So again, one can go back and look at it, how the Chinese finally realized that these are Chinese people. They must take some responsibility. And they're just not a handful of them, but millions of them. And when you have the numbers of that kind of numbers, uh, consciousness grew and the officials began to notice. One of the earliest reports, for example, was when the diplomats appointed by China to go to Europe, passed through Singapore and, uh, and elsewhere in Southeast Asia, and negotiated with the British and the French over Indochina, the Dutch over Indonesia, or East, uh, Netherlands, East Indies. Then they realized that there were so many Chinese out there, and some of them were very wealthy and very well educated and very aware of the modern world, much more so than the majority of the people in China. And that was an awakening. And from then onwards, they began to take notice. The, the, term, the term Hua Chao, for example, that I mentioned earlier on, Chinese temporarily abroad, was invented precisely because they realized that there were all these Chinese out there that had no citizenship or nationality of any kind. The only nationality they could qualify for was being Chinese nationals if the Chinese had such a thing as a concept of nationality, which the Chinese did not have. The Qing dynasty did not have a concept of nationality or citizenship. 
identifications were, of all the Chinese abroad were with their home villages, their families and clan associations, their linkages back in, particularly in Fujian and Guangdong, but not with officials in Beijing. So that discovery was what triggered off the whole idea that the Chinese overseas were meaningful to China. And that, of course, started something new, something that has now become quite exceptional. I have been challenged from time to time in my studies of Chinese emigration and migrants, migrant societies, and so on, to say, why do you distinguish the Chinese from other kinds of migrants? All Chinese migrants must be the same as all migrants everywhere. And I, I agree. They have so much in common. Just being a migrant or migrating, leaving your country to, to live somewhere else and work somewhere else, you share similar problems. And that is true. But the one thing that differentiates the Chinese is, in fact, the attention of Chinese governments since the end of the 19th century. When the last few decades of the Qing government began to pay attention to the Chinese overseas and set out these consulates. These consulates, Singapore was only one of them. They set one up in San Francisco, they were in Japan, there was one in Cuba, in, in, uh, in Peru, I think there's another one. And the, as they set up embassies, they then had consulates uh, were set up. Because then they were aware that there's such a thing as nationality, that the Westerners use nationality against the Chinese when the Chinese treated any European badly, the country would object. And in fact, the country would say, that's a good reason why we should attack you again. You know, that happened many, many times. You kill one of us, you have to pay for that. But the Chinese, the Chinese government never paid for when Chinese got killed uh, outside. So that awareness emerged out of that last years of the Qing dynasty and also was related very much to the way the revolution against the Manchus happened in exactly the same framework. That once you're aware that you're Chinese and your government is not looking after you, you say there's something wrong with that government. There was something wrong with that government all along, but nobody said much about it. But now you say, ah, I'm a Chinese national, I'm a Hua Chao. I have certain rights, I have certain expectations of the government. And the government hasn't done anything to to help me, so I demand attention, and so on and so forth. So both sides began to respond to each other. So it's a very new phenomenon. So what distinguished the Chinese migrants from so many other migrants was this immense, intense care by the government of the late Qing to the Republic, especially to the National Republic, when they related their experiences for nationalism with Sun Yat-sen's supporters among the overseas Chinese at a time when he was in deep trouble. And he was an outlaw, exile, and he was saved by many Chinese overseas, both here and in North America. And there was a kind of coming together of common interest, which helped to build up the idea that the Chinese government should care for its Chinese overseas. And they did it in a very intense way. The most intensive was really under the Kuomintang from 1928 onwards. Uh, I, I grew up with that, with that, so I'm very sensitive to that, how that was. I mean, I'm not alone. I think p almost everybody up to 1949 and maybe 1950s, almost every Chinese abroad were nationals of China simply because they could not be nationals of anybody else. They were certainly not British nationals. British subjects are different. You're not a British national, nor a French or a Dutch. You could not be. And there were no other nationalities. The local indigenous people were not in charge of their own fate. They didn't have nations. So it was not until the 1940s and 50s, late 40s and 50s, that new nations emerged and that Chinese had to make a choice what nation to join us. So that's a different story. But you can see that all those years, the Chinese government thought this was their responsibility. All these Chinese out there, only China gave them nationality. And this applies even to the Pranakan, whether they thought of it or not, as far as the Chinese government was concerned. If you say you are Chinese, or your parents are Chinese, your son, you are Chinese, and you are a Hua Chao. So you don't have to say you're Hua Chao. 
The Chinese government has said, all of you are Huachao. So that, it's how it started. And it became very serious. So if you think back about it, it became a matter of competition between the PRC and the ROC in Taiwan for at least 20, 30 years, very active competition, when both governments in Taipei and in Beijing would send out representatives to try and win, woo each other's Chinese, I mean, to get the Chinese to move from loyalty to Taiwan to loyalty to PRC, and so on and so forth. I mean, I, it's, it's a very messy story, and I, I don't want to go into that. But what I'm trying to underline is this very deep root from the late 19th century to now, where the government of China felt a special responsibility towards the Chinese overseas and expected, and they got in, in return, the gratitude of the Chinese overseas, who gave a lot of their time and energy and money to help China. I mean, I mentioned Tan Kah Kee. Tan Kah Kee's achievement in uniting all the effort in Southeast Asia to raise funds for the defense of China against Japan was greatly appreciated by both the Kuomintang and the Chinese Communist Party. But of course, in the end, he's, he sympathized with New China, and New China has treated him and his family and any, anybody connected with Tan Kah Kee with great respect and gratitude because of what he stood for. So you can see that these are so, there are so many complex elements involved in this relationship. So what the Chinese government today wants to do with the Chinese overseas is related not so much with the old generations of Chinese who have settled for a long time, so centuries and so on, but with their new Chinese. The, the major problem today, what is uncertain today, and I, I have certainly no, no clear picture of what will emerge, is the fact that there are now about up to 10 million Xin Yimin who have left China to live and work overseas. And the question is, do they leave and never come back? Or do the Chinese government feel a responsibility for them and therefore want them to keep their links and ties with China and wherever possible help to serve China and maybe return to China one day? All these are now in question. And we end up, they're not, it's not so much the, the, all the Chinese would be descended from earlier people. Of course, they get caught up in this general statement of Chinese. But the people of con real concern is these millions of Xin Yimin, many of whom are very talented, highly qualified, in great demand, whose skills and experiences are in great need and in demand in China. What to do about them? And in trying to enunciate a policy, it is hard for Beijing to say, we only want these Chinese and not the other Chinese. <laughs> so it comes out with statements which are very general. But I can assure you that they are primarily aimed at the Xin Yimin. But it, of course, it spreads out. And you can identify with that if you wish to. But you are not really the main targets of what they're talking about. <laughs> I, I, I can I can go on, but I'll leave it at that. We have a question here. Uh, good evening, Mr. Wong. Uh, my name is Michelle Ma. I'm from uh, mainland China, uh, Manchurian, Liaoning. Um, I've been seeing for, for for nine years till now. Uh, I have a question for you tonight. Um, in the past uh, one, two hundred years, uh, since 100 years to 200 years ago, a lot of huge population of Chinese moved out of China uh, and settled locally in different uh, corners of the world. And uh, if, we group the, if we call them different groups of overseas Chinese, uh, in your opinion, do you think there's any uh, characteristics for each group overseas Chinese? And if they was, uh, what are they and why? And um, another question is, uh, Based on your experience uh, to interface with the overseas Chinese, you think which group are trying hardest or uh, doing the best job in terms of uh, protecting, promoting, and carrying the Chinese culture and heritage? Thank you. That's really a very big question. Uh, I, 
Let me just start by saying that the diversity of Chinese that I spoke of is much, much greater than I can convey. I mean, I have met Chinese in Cuba. I have met those who have born and brought up in South America, North America, Mauritius, all over Southeast Asia, and the variety is so great. Each group of Chinese have adapted to life in their particular environment. And all I can say is that the only thing in common is when they say, and this is self-identity, because I, can, I have no basis for judging, they say they are Chinese and proud to be Chinese. They want to say their ancestors are Chinese, whatever they are today. That, I think, is widely found. That's the one thing I hear everywhere. No matter what language they spoke, what religion they had, how they dressed, how they felt, how they behaved, the one thing that in their self-identity, if they say, tell you they are very proud, they have Chinese ancestry, they are Chinese, and not at all ashamed to be seen or called Chinese, then that is one thing you can say right around the world. But beyond that, what else have they got in common? It's very, very hard to, to, to go. I mean, that is why I say you have need volumes. And they are, in fact, volumes. For each country, different stories are told, different responses to different challenges. And they are extraordinary stories. To, and I have to say, they're fascinating stories. And I'm tremendously moved by most of them as each group of Chinese trying to adapt themselves to conditions that are so different. And sometimes they are well accepted and received. Other times they are rejected and discriminated against and pushed out. And some of their experiences are extremely painful. Others are really extraordinarily peaceful and happy ones. Sometimes quite hard to explain why some are so peaceful and happy and others so painful and miserable. And all these variations are out there. So when this comes back to the point of how do you generalize? So I can understand why the officials in Beijing, when they have to use the word overseas China, the Chinese abroad, they can't distinguish. They can only use one term. And in the past, they used Hua Chao. And then Hua Chao became a bit difficult. Then they used Hua Ren, Hai Wai Hua Ren, Wai Ji Hua Ren, all kinds of terms. And now they found that there are millions of new migrants voluntarily leaving China and remaining out and not wanting to come back in many cases. More and more of them don't go back to China. How do you call them? What do you call them? They're not. In one sense, they are Hua Chao because many of them are still Chinese citizens living abroad. But the term Hua Chao has been applied to those in the past in such a way that these new people don't call them, don't see themselves as Hua Chao. In fact, I was always very struck, uh, it's not a problem in Southeast Asia, we, we don't use the word Hua Chao much anymore. But in North America, Hua Chao is still very much used. And Hua Chao means all those who settle at the descendants of those who went during the gold rush. The Seyap people, the Cantonese people, the Lao Hua Chao, they call it, some people call Lao Hua Chao, who settled there 100 years ago. And they are proud to be Hua Chao. And the newcomers are not Hua Chao. <laughs> and the newcomers are seen as being quite different. Xin Yimin is quite a nice way of distinguishing between the two. I remember this from even way back. This is not even nothing to do with the communists or the present regime. I remember when I first went to the United States, I was very struck by the Hua Chao I met were people in San Francisco, in various parts of California and so on, who, who are descended from people of the 19th century and so on, who had been through a particular, they shared a particular experience of having been tremendously discriminated against, badly treated, treated, in fact, uh, hardly uh, acceptable to anybody, and surviving all that, and then de deriving, as it were, satisfaction about the fact that they survived it, 
and still are Chinese and proud to be Chinese. That sort of feeling. <clears throat> to them, that is very special. In a way, like the Pranakan, you know, how they survived as Chinese when there were small groups scattered around the islands of Southeast Asia. But these were people also scattered around, with a few exceptions like in San Francisco, scattered around in small communities, surviving and keeping that sense of Chineseness. Now, they don't accept that these newcomers are the same. And the newcomers don't think of them as Chinese. They come in universities, high schools, businesses, into New York, into Ivy League universities, brilliant PhDs, and so on. They don't see themselves as Hua Chao at all. So even within that North American community, that division is quite, quite, quite a serious one. Uh, and it's not necessarily expressed in terms of loyalty towards Taiwan or PRC. Not necessarily. They may all be uh, inclined to su support the new China against the Republic of China. But among themselves, they are very clear. So-and-so is a Hua Chao. So-and-so has a newcomer. He's just arrived. And he belongs to a different category. So when you think of that, I can, to some extent anyway, understand how difficult it is for the officials in Beijing to describe them. No single term could be accurately used. And that must be very, very difficult for all of them. Thank you. Uh, I think we only have one uh, last question to take. We don't have uh, enough time. So that gentleman at the back, this will be the last question for tonight. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I have about three questions here. I'll tr <laughs> I try to make it a short one. It's not very long. Uh, the first one is about language trend in Singapore. The second one is about the purpose of the Speak Mandarin campaign in Singapore. And the third is a uh, changing demographic in Singapore. So the first one is uh, recent surveys. In fact, not just recent surveys, but for a long time, surveys have shown that the more and more Chinese families in Singapore, they are the youngest one especially are speaking English and English is gaining greater dominance in, in, in not just uh, the, uh, in our official lives, but also in our private lives as well, in our families. So do you think it is necessary for Chinese Singaporean to speak Mandarin to assert our Chinese identity? Uh, and if 30 years down the road, uh, Mandarin, you know, let's say, this is a scenario question, is eradicated, you know, because younger Singaporean getting out of touch of this language, what would you say to those future people who want to get rid of it, you know, out of Singapore? So the second question is, uh, this speak Mandarin campaign, has, it feels very weird to me and uh, I can't understand what, what is happening because uh, government say is to keep in touch with our roots, although we are, it's not really when we present the hard solid fact that we are Teochew, Hokkien's, but you know, they, they will change their mind and say, oh, no, it's not about keeping your roots. You have to connect with China and things like that. So, but, but I really can't find a, a single reason that are, they are very consistent about. But one thing that I think might be is that uh, it does make uh, uh, mainland Chinese, especially from the northern China, it makes them, the immigrant coming to Singapore, makes them easier to assimilate into our, to our country, you know, you know one of the reasons, I think. I'm not sure what do you think about that. And uh, third is the changing demographic. With uh, rising immigration from mainland Chinese into Singapore, we can feel it, you know. What, what do you think about this change in Singapore in the now and in the future? How will it go about, you know? Uh, should the old Chinese, uh, southern Chinese immigrant in Singapore uh, assert our cultural influence with greater importance and priority or should we take charge of the direction of our cultural and cultural roadmap? Uh, for example, uh, recently the government said they want to list down our intangible heritage uh, and considering that many of these traditions are gone uh, would it be appropriate to let's say for the new Chinese immigrant to say, hey, come on, let's uh, at least down Xiao Long Bao and Zha Jia Meng as one of Singapore's intangible heritage? How would you think about that? Yeah. Seems to me as you went along, you were answering some of your own questions. <laughs> Secondly, it seems to me some of those questions are really addressed to the Singapore government, <laughs> not to a historian like me. <laughs> <laughs> 
So I don't know. I mean, you 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 have raised a lot of things. But of course, it's 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 valid to raise these questions. But I'm not sure that you speak for all the Chinese in Singapore, or the questions are the same for every person of Chinese descent or Chinese origin in Singapore. So it is part and parcel of this evolving situation in the plural society, not only plural between Chinese and others, but plural among the Chinese themselves. So pluralism is, should not be taken as ethnically defined. Pluralism is a pluralism of many different origins, many different ideas, many faiths, different faiths, many different uh, responses to mod modernity, modernization, the ideals of uh, political ideals or social and cultural ideals about art, about painting, about literature, music. What, all these are drawing Singaporeans in different ways and attracting different kinds of Singaporeans to them and creating new senses of what you identify with, what you love, what you care for, and so on. So, so much is happening. Your questions seem to me directed really to the government. So I will ask some government official to reply to them. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, um, Prof. And to all of you, thank you for coming down tonight. Uh, uh, yeah, do join us for our next uh, Prominence Speaker Series in September and October. Uh, do look out for details in our website. Thank you very much for coming down.